scripture lesson of today is Second Peter, Second Peter, verses chapter one. Second Peter, chapter one, verses two to eleven. Second Peter, chapter one, verses two to eleven. It's found in your pew Bibles on page 1,811. That is page 1,811 of your pew Bibles. So, towards the back. Okay. Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God, of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, uh, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the, in the divine nature. Having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, mutual affection, and to mutual affection, love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But if any of you do not have them, you are nearsighted and blind, and you have forgotten that you have been cleansed from your past sins. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election for if you do these things, you will never stumble, and you will, and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So, a little, maybe it's a little long, I don't know. But, um, yeah, the title of the sermon is Godly Ambition. Godly Ambition. And um, I got to say, when I first thought of, like, I have to preach, I, I looked at, what was the verse of the day? I saw it. I was like, you know what? This is the verse I should preach on. And I saw it. I, I, I loved it. I thought it was something to, that should have been preached on. You know what I mean? And this guy, Peter, he reminds me of someone, actually of a movie I saw pretty recently. It's a movie. It's called The Great Beer Run. The great, and a part of the reason why I saw the movie, honestly, is because it in part took, takes place in North Bergen, by the way. There's... Like, it's, they actually took, like, a bar from North Bergen. They blocked it off. I was like, oh, I got to watch that movie at one point. So anyway, so this, this, this movie called The Great Beer Run, it's based off of a true story of a man named Chicky Donahue. Chicky Donahue was a, a guy that lived around during the Vietnam War, and he was looking on the news, like, oh, uh, you know, the Americans were fighting the, the, the Vietnamese, but we're also, there's a lot of us, a lot, a lot of them are dying. And he sees in the news, like, there's a lot of, like, you know, it's body bags, and it looks really somber, and it's really sad. And he's like, oh, man, why are they putting this up on the news? We got to put that, you know, we got to support the troops. We got to show them love, you know? And, you know, he's in a bar. He's kind of, kind of drunk, you know, he's, like, known in a, as a party animal. And he's there. He's like, you know what? I'm going to go over there. And, and to all those people, he starts naming the different names of people that would go to the bar. And I'm going to go, I'm going to go and uh, get them beers. And everyone's like, yeah, we're going to go get them beers, you know. And uh, it, it, word travels around. And he's like, no, I'm being serious. And people kind of didn't believe him. He's like, all right, yeah, you wake up like three in the afternoon. You don't do this. Like, you know, you're not like a capable guy, you know. He's like, oh, come on, what are you talking about? You know, he wanted to prove something. He wanted to prove to the people around him. He wanted to prove to himself. He wanted to prove that it's like, listen, that we support you guys out there in the Vietnam War. So he goes and he asks, when's the next boat to Vietnam? Like, and, uh, and the guy that works on, on, on the ship was like, oh, it's actually within a day. It's like within like 12 hours. And he is someone that works on boats just on occasion. Like he just, he works on uh, maintenance on like the engine, whatever. So that's how he was able to get this boat ride. 
So it, within, since within the 12 hours, he doesn't tell anyone. He just gets a whole bunch of beers in a big backpack and he heads out to Vietnam. And he's there and he literally, no one believes that he's, he's a, a, just a civilian. You know, they think he's like CIA. So whenever he says, oh, I got to take me over here, take me over there. It's like, oh, okay. And he starts handing out beers to all these different people, to all his, his friends back at home. And they just look at him like, this is, you're stupid. Like, this is dumb. What do you mean? Like, I could have gotten beers and would have went back into the town. Like, what do you, you're going to get yourself killed. It's like, no, we, we support you. He's like, and they're, they're like, all right, well, okay, thanks, I guess. You know, every, every, most of them are, are kind of like, they're like that, you know? It's like, what are you doing here? You know, and he was able to get further and further into real, like, right into the middle of the combat of Vietnam War. He was able to escape, and eventually he says the story, you know? And this story of, of, of Chicky, it, it just reminded me of Peter. You see, Peter, he was known to be, I don't know, like, uh, is that Peter the Zealot, like a Simon Peter the Zealot. And the Zealot is like, you know, he's like almost like he worked for uh, like a, a terrorist organization to go and take out the Romans, you know, the Romans that are occupying Israel or something like that. You know, he wanted to make sure that like, uh, uh, Israel would go back to its, like, its glory days and stuff. And, and he's, also, he's also just a fisherman. He wasn't really like this real knowledgeable guy. He wasn't a teacher or anything. And he's one of the disciples of Jesus, and there's a few things that, that are attributed to Peter. Peter was a very, very, like, just like, like headstrong kind of a guy, right? So there's, there's times when, like, there's, there's a, a big storm. He's the guy walking out of the boat, trying to step on water, takes one step, takes two steps, looks down, like, oh, my gosh, he falls, you know? Peter's the guy to be like, oh, you know what? You are, you are the Christ. You are the, you are the Messiah, you know, Peter's that guy too. But then also Peter is the same guy that Jesus is like, all right, well, you know, time's going to come where they're going to, you know, where they're going to arrest me. He's like, I won't let that ever happen. And then and Jesus is looking at him like, what are, you, what are you talking about? Like, get away from me, Satan, you know? He's like, well, he's, like he's trying to force his will always on a situation. Peter's the same guy that when Jesus is taken, right, the, the Roman guard goes to grab uh, uh, Jesus, and then Peter's the guy to go and try to chop the ear off. Oh, I gotta, gotta stop him. You think he's aiming for the ears? Trying to kill the guy, and he just misses, you know. And Jesus, is like, this is not how this is, you know. He puts the ear, he, he prays for the ear to go back on. The ear goes back on. Like, you live by the sword, you die by the sword. So these two people, they're just, they're both trying to like prove something, you know. They're both trying to be like, like, listen, like, uh, Chicky was like, listen, I'm not a loser. I do care about these people. And I'm going to go and do this. Beers to the, the troops in Vietnam in the middle of the war. Like, that's just kind of like stupid. And Peter at the same time is like trying to like, oh, I'm going to prevent Jesus from dying on a cross. It's like you're going against God's plan. At one point, you know that Jesus is, is the Messiah. And at the other point, you're trying to prevent the plan of, of the Lord. So these two people, they both have this like strong ambition, headstrong Sometimes they're, they, don't, they lack thought in what they're doing, but there's, there is a lot of ambition to get something done. And, and ambition sometimes is, is like uh, looked down upon for whatever reason. It's like, oh, you can't be too ambitious. It's like sometimes looked down upon it within the church. But ambition, just as I would say even like intelligence, is something of a moral neutral. So in other words, it's neither good nor bad. It's something that... People have in different quantities. Same thing if you're really, really smart, you could use that intelligence to be a good person or a bad person. Intelligence in and of itself isn't a bad quality. We understand? So uh, how the, the definition of ambition is from uh, dictionary.com is an earnest desire for some type of achievement or distinction as power, honor, fame, or wealth and the willingness to strive for its attainment. So, Peter, I want you to think of Peter like, yeah, he's this headstrong kind of a guy. He's like, um, out of all disciples, I would picture in my head, Peter is that guy that would probably like, would, if he was around nowadays, he'd be the guy like with motivational speeches and like lifting weights or whatever. It's like, Whoa, you could do it, you know? Peter's like this headstrong kind of a guy, you know? And, with, and you could kind of uh, sense that in his writings. You know, in this letter... Peter has very uh, like ambitious goals. These three goals. One, 
He says, to be useful and productive in the kingdom of God or in the knowledge of Jesus, right? That's part of the goal is to be useful in the kingdom of God or knowledge of Jesus. Two is to enter into heaven, right, with a grand entrance. He's like, you know, it's something to achieve, an ambitious goal. Enter into heaven with a grand entrance. And then three, to make sure there's no doubt in any, anyone's mind, uh, whether, whether man or God, that he's a, he's a chosen man of God. And he wants to prove that. And you could read that within, the, within these passages. And then Peter is near the end of his life when he's writing this, this letter. So he still has this like, ambitious nature about him, but he's applying it to being a Christian. Amen? So he has just this, this drive in his mind to be ambitious, but he's applying it to being a Christian. And so these are the goals, right? To be productive, uh, and no doubt in anyone's mind that he is a chosen man of God, a grand entrance into heaven. But he also goes into how do you go about doing that? So how do you go about, how do you live your life and, uh, to do so? So he says these godly qualities to strive for, right, for these ambitious goals is, well, from the NLT, right? It says moral excellence. So he's already starting off being morally excellent. Have knowledge, knowledge of the Lord, knowledge of Christ, knowledge of God. Self-control. Be, uh, have patient endurance, being able to suffer. You know, be uh, a form of godliness in any form, shape, or way. Be a godly man or woman. Have brotherly affection. And then at the, at the same time also, in case you miss anything, overall just love for everyone. Overall just have love for everyone. And uh, what's important to know is that all of this is achievable because God has provided for us. Amen. God has provided the means to achieve this. And that's also a part of what, this, what these verses are saying. God has provided what is needed for you to live a godly life. There's no excuse. There's no reason not to. And this is what I would say is the true prosperity gospel. Amen. We can say that I've been cleansed of my old ways and I've been given everything necessary to live a life worthy to be called a child of God. You can say that. You can honestly say that. You can know that to be... And if you don't... And it says, like, what, what price... Hold on. What price can you put on having a good reputation among God and men? Okay? What price can you put on, on not having a crippling addiction? Not having anything taken away from you? No matter what's happening in your life, just no, nothing can take away peace and joy. What price can you put on that? What price can you put on wisdom and guidance given to you from God. This is the true prosperity gospel. And it, the, the thing is, we are provided this from the Lord. So what does it mean then? When we do, when we, as, as, as a body of believers, what does it mean then if we do have anxiety, when we do have depression, when we do have addictions? What does that mean when we say that we are truly, you're truly saved, but you, you suffer from this? Well, then Peter, well, and, and there's a few things. What Peter would say is, one, be encouraged that truly God has provided a way to keep you from falling away. God has provided what is necessary to make sure you don't fall away. Two, any sin that has power over you is because you allowed it to. Now, that's crazy to think, but this is, I'm not saying this that I'm perfect. You know, I'm saying this because this is what the Word of God says. Amen. The Word of God, it goes, if, if there's any sin that has power over you, because you allowed that sin to take power over you. And three, if, if you have forgotten that God has cleansed you of your old sins. God has, just, sometimes we forget how, how bad, how messed up, or, or how a lack of peace or a lack of joy we had before knowing Christ. And then sometimes we go back to our old ways. And it's like, don't do that. Stop going back to your old... You don't need to go back to your old sins. You don't need to go back to your old ways. Now, I mean, to somewhat to the extent of, of what's going on there, I have, a, I have a personal story of... There was a time when I was in college. And, um, wow, like, it was, it was tough. Like, I was full-time minister... Well, full, no, I wouldn't say full-time minister. I mean, full-time volunteer at a church, I should say. You know, I was on drums. I was doing youth group. 
I was doing prayer meeting. I was doing uh, consistory meetings and then full-time student at, 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 uh, at uh, school in New York City, right? To be like a personal trainer, like moving around a lot. And I was suffering from insomnia. And it was something that I, I would suffer from. I like I just, there's times where I just go like a month with, with just like on average three or four hours of sleep a day. Every, I was like, oh my gosh, I guess it's just one of those times is they literally, I see the sunrise, want to pull out my hair. You know, I was like, oh my gosh. And, and I still had to work, you know, still had to do stuff. And I remember going up the stairs to my room. And I mean, I tried, I tried not drinking coffee, which I mean, I'm a Cuban and not drinking coffee. Like, oh my gosh. Like I tried not drinking coffee. I tried meditating. I tried uh, sleep aids. I tried a whole bunch of different things. It's like, someone's like, don't take naps or take naps. I, oh, okay. I, I tried it all, all these little things. And I remember saying this prayer somewhat like this. And I was like, Lord, I mean, maybe if it's possible, can you please just give me one night of good sleep? Maybe. Can you maybe? And then I thought about what I said, like, maybe? What do you mean maybe? Like, of course, like, God can do anything. And I, I just thought, like, well, I, I let this, this insomnia have such a strong sort of uh, a hold on me. Like I gave it more power. I respected my problem more than I respected the power of God. Amen. And I didn't, I didn't notice that until I was there, I was like crawling up my stairs, a you know, book bag, oh my gosh, hopefully I get some sleep because I'm so tired. I was like, no, that's it. Like, what am I, no, I trust you that I will get sleep. And I'm telling you, I started, you know, it didn't matter if I drank coffee, if I took a nap or I didn't take a nap or whatever. I was able to sleep afterwards. Yeah, I was like, was I like cured of that? Because I truly, I trusted and I believed. Now I said, oh, is that biblical? Does the Lord, that the Lord works only if you believe or if you trust? Well, if you go back to when Jesus was in his hometown, a lot, not so many miracles were performed because not too many people believed. Too many people were like, oh, you're just that carpenter guy. You're just whatever. You're just the son of Mary. What do you mean? So there is a point biblically where miracles didn't happen as much because people just didn't believe. They didn't trust they didn't think in the work of the Lord. So let's trust in the work of Christ. Amen. Let's trust in the work of Christ for you and us to live truly godly lives. Amen? Amen. Let it be our lifelong ambition, right? To respond correctly to God's grace and love for us. Amen? Let us not think of just like, a, a, we have this ambition, like ambition to strive, to attain and it's not earthly ambition, whereas you're trying to prove something to someone else. You're trying to prove that you're a better person than someone else. You're trying to prove that uh, to yourself, I'm going to prove the haters wrong or whatever. Which is, that's an earthly ambition. But a godly ambition, right? It doesn't have to deal with other people. It has to deal with your, how will you respond to God? It's between you and the Lord. That is where your ambition lies. Not with other people and what they do or what they don't do. Right? We got to remember the prayer of the tax collector. Remember there is a tax collector and there's like a, a Pharisee and they go into the a place where they're going to go pray, to go to the temple to pray. And uh, the tax collector, he just bows his head like, I'm just a sinner. And this other guy, the Pharisee is like, well, at least I'm not as bad as this tax collector. I go and I, and I fast twice, twice a week. I make sure I give my tithes and all this stuff. And he, he He's trying to prove to God, like, hey, you know what? I do all these things, and I'm way better than this tax collector. And tax collector is just like, I'm humble before you. I'm just a sinner. Please forgive me. Obviously, the prayer of the tax collector is heard, right? But the, because the, um, uh, the ambition of the Pharisee is an earthly ambition, is to prove to other people, right? To prove to other people that, he's, that he is better than other people. And that's the wrong kind of ambition. Right? Their ambition should be to prove, listen, Lord, I know what you've done for me. And I'm going to work hard. I'm going to strive. And you've given me everything I needed to live a godly life. I'm going to live it out. And that's, that's a, this, this is a part of who Peter is. And it's a part of who we should be. Sometimes we focus too much on, oh, I have this issue. I have this problem. I have this uh, this sin issue, I have this uh, addiction, or, or I have these things that happened to me in the past, I, 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 gotta, I just I got to hold on to that. You don't have to hold on to that. You have been, been given everything you need to live a godly life 
today. If you don't, you have forgotten of your old, you have forgotten of, of the, that you've been cleansed. Or, or, or two, you just, you know, you're, you're just holding, you're holding back on truly in, in enjoying the presence of the Lord. And there's probably a lot of pride and a lot of ego. And it's still something where you have more faith in the world than you do in God. Have more faith in the Lord in every aspect of your life. Wherever there is sin, there is, you're trusting in the world. Don't trust in the world. If there's an area of your life where there is sin, understand you're probably not trusting in the Lord in that area of your life. And, and uh, with that, I'd like to close this off in prayer. Let us always trust in the Lord. Be uh, ambitious to do what's right before the eyes of God. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for your love. We thank you, Lord, for all that you've done, for all that you will do. We come now asking in Jesus' name, Lord, you reveal to us wherever we have uh, fallen short, wherever we have forgotten, Lord, that you have cleansed us, Lord. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name, you put it in our hearts, you put it in our lives, Lord, you put it in our minds, Lord, that you have truly provided everything that is needed, everything that is needed to live a godly life today. We don't have to, to give in to sins of the old. It doesn't matter if you had uh, issues uh, even up to yesterday. You don't have to have that issue anymore, Lord. We pray, Lord, that we truly believe and we trust you, Lord. We trust in the Holy Spirit living within all believers, Lord, that we are, that we are protected, that we will enter into heaven, Lord Jesus, because of the Holy Spirit living within us and we could trust in you and that you are uh, you are a God, you are Messiah, you are our, our high priest, Lord. You are good to cleanse us every single time of, of our old ways, of our old sins. Lord, we pray that we don't uh, entertain the lies of, of the world, that we don't entertain uh, feeding into the, 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 the sinful flesh that we have, Lord. That we don't believe the lies of the world, we don't believe the, the lives of Satan. That he wants to condemn, he wants to accuse Lord, we pray, Lord, that we don't, we don't pay attention, that we don't give in uh, to those lies, to the accusations, that we don't give in to feeding uh, uh, the sinful flesh, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for listening. We thank you, Lord, for your love. Give us the strength we need, truly. You, you have provided for us, Lord, to live a godly life. And we thank you, and in Jesus' name we pray, amen.